thank you so much for being here and for sharing this beautiful stage uh, and supporting Lake Observatory. Uh, so I wanted to tell you a story uh, about where you come from. So it's an origin story. Uh, I really want to tell you, I would like to tell you the genealogy tree of every single atom in your body, cosmologically speaking, but I'm actually going to pick three elements that are essential to us and to life, and I'm going to tell you about how we are part of the universe and the universe is part of us. Um, this is really beautifully uh, highlighted by Carl Sagan, who said, the beauty of a living thing is not the atoms that go into it, but the ways that those atoms are put together. Yeah? And in principle, uh, astronomers really look at the periodic table and think about where these elements came from. Yeah? And rather than give you a convoluted picture, uh, I'm going to simplify it and pick some of our favorite elements. Uh, so we're going to be a little self-centered. Uh, and to do that, we have to talk about ourselves. Uh, so in our bodies, we have about 10 to the 28 atoms in our bodies. We're incredibly numerous. We have more atoms in our bodies than stars in the universe. The you know, grains uh, of sand across the entire surface of the Earth. So we're incredibly numerous. Um, this is a one followed by 28 zeros, <laughs> for those that are not as familiar with uh, scientific notation. And really, when we think about what atoms are important, it's important to you know, be a little self-centered and think about, well, the vast majority of our mass is oxygen. Yeah. So that should be a central element. The second one is carbon, hydrogen, as you know, uh, essential to life, and nitrogen. That's our main composition as humans. And you know, those elements were actually synthesized, as I'm going to tell you, from these spectacular cataclysmic events in the universe. So we're going to start, of course, with oxygen. Uh, oh, no, hydrogen. Uh, why hydrogen? Uh, so hydrogen is actually the element that is the oldest element that was synthesized during the first three minutes in the history of the universe. It's the oldest. And atoms are so durable that if your hydrogen atoms can actually speak to you, they will tell you about the origin of the Big Bang and the entire history of the universe. I mean, they're being there. And Ultimately, we are the recipients of all that cosmic history. So hydrogen is the most abundant element, and as I said, was synthesized uh, in the Big Bang very, very quickly together with helium. So astronomers, we call everything that is not hydrogen and helium a metal. So hydrogen and helium came in the Big Bang, and then everything else was actually synthesized inside stars. So all of these elements that are so important to us, they all came from the universe. And the way that you can think about is that initially, astronomers, we call the universe pristine because they only have hydrogen and helium. And as a function of time, as these elements were synthesized, what we call the metallicity of the universe increased as a function of time. So we also use metal content as a way to measure age, roughly speaking. The stars that are the more metal poor are the stars that are the oldest. You know, they were formed where the universe was really only a few percent of its current age. And then, you know, our second element, which of course is essential to us, is oxygen. And oxygen has an incredibly beautiful history, and its history is directly related to the lifetimes of very massive stars. So I want you to think about our sun, and I want you to think about, well, what happened if our sun was 10 times more massive? Yeah, and that's what we call a massive star. Uh, those stars have 10 to the 58 atoms inside of them, so significantly more than what we have in our bodies. And those stars go through a constant battle against gravity. So gravity wants to compress them, yeah? And in order to survive that compression, they actually burn elements. They take lighter elements and fuse them into progressively heavier elements. 
And that generation of heat keeps the fight against gravity. And there's a really important element in this story, which is iron, which is the, you know, what gives the redness to our blood. Iron is the most bound nuclei in the universe. Yeah? So once fusion gets all the way to iron in the course of these stars, basically fusion is not able to continue fighting against gravity, and gravity wins. And the course of these stars collapse. Now, another really beautiful feature about stars is that the more massive the star, the more luminous it is, and the more quickly they burn their fuel. Yeah, so you, you want to think about massive stars as sort of like the Elvis Presley of humans. You know, they're incredibly luminous, but they have shorter lifetimes. But they dominate the total light content of the universe. Yeah? So your origin story starts with a massive star. Now, when the core collapses, uh, which is illustrated here, an object at the center of a massive star which is the densest object in the universe, which is also going to be a very important protagonist in our story, which is called a neutron star, is form. And in that formation, it ultimately halts the collapse. And that halting of the collapse generates so much heat that it actually explodes the star. And it is in that explosion that the oxygen is actually made. So I do, you know, high-performing supercomputing, so we try to make models of these objects because, of course, we cannot go there and experiment with stars. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is basically what happens to the core of a star. Uh, and as you can see from the clock, everything happens very quickly. The core collapses. What you're seeing there is really heat or temperature, which we refer to as entropy. This neutron star in the center halts the collapse, and the region there gets incredibly hot. It's like a pressure cooker. Until so basically the pressure rises to be strong enough that it actually overcomes the collapse and it launches an explosion. Yeah. And these ultimately last a fraction of a second to a second. And that's how long it takes for the explosion to take place. And it is in that interface as soon as the collapse is halted that oxygen is actually synthesized in very vast amounts and it's ejected into the interstellar medium. Now, these explosions are incredibly bright. So you're looking here at a galaxy before it had a supernova and after it had a supernova, yeah? And these are what we call type two supernova, which come from the collapse of a massive star. Now, this galaxy has about 100 billion stars, and the death of one star becomes, you know, incredibly more luminous than all of these stars put together. <laughs> yeah? So, this is basically signal the production of oxygen. Yeah? And just to give you a feeling, we can actually trace the atoms, the oxygen atoms in your body to hundreds of millions of these explosions all mixed together within you. And of course, those explosions happen in the Milky Way, not in other galaxies. Uh, but this is an explosion in our own Milky Way. It's a, what we call a supernova remnant. This is how the explosion looks about a millennium after the explosion. And what you vastly see in there is freshly synthesized oxygen atoms. So now imagine 100 million of those put together in your body. Yeah? And they can be traced back to us, yeah? So this is our origin story, our main origin story, is that our, the oxygen atoms in our body were synthesized in these incredibly bright, yet, you know, beautiful uh, explosions. Now, these elements, uh, this is, this is a large-scale simulation uh, showing the Milky Way like, a Milky Way-like galaxy. And what this just shows is that there's so much energy generation within our own Milky Way that there's a lot of mixing. So all of these deposition of elements get constantly mixed and recycled. And that's why your body is formed of so many of these systems, you know, all basically mixed together. Now, I want to make the analogy also of what happens in the universe to what happens in our atmosphere. But you can think about this way that you can imagine there are multiple, multiple of this phenomena in the Milky Way. They mix, 
they produce these gas clouds, and then those gas clouds collapse and form new stars. So the universe is this constant recycling of gas and the formation of stars. But something that you now know is that as a function of time, the gas gets constantly enriched, and its metal content increases as a function of time. Yeah? And that's why we are so many generations of stars that have lived across our Milky Way, all mixed together. Now, to make this analogy a little bit closer to home, we can think about oxygen within our own atmosphere. So I'm standing here. Uh, I mean, now you have masks, so you're being less effective in giving me your oxygen atoms. But we go through like 300 liters of oxygen every day through our bodies as we breathe. So I'm incredibly grateful that I'm sharing this stage with you. Why? Because when I go home, I'm going to take your oxygen atoms with me. Yeah? So then you can think about, well, but what about generations and generations of humans that have come before us? Do we have atoms from them? The answer is yes. You know, so breathing is actually breathing history. And you can do a calculation and say, well, how many atoms I have from someone I admire, Frida Kahlo? Well, about 100 million atoms in your body belong once to Frida Kahlo. No? So if you're feeling like you're not inspired, you just have to, you know, from your 10 to the 28 atoms, you have to look at those 100 million and really find that inspiration that you need. And, you know, this can apply to a broad range of people that have inspired you uh, in your life. So here's Octavio Paz, Nobel Prize winner from Mexico, an amazing writer, Chabela Vargas, who's a... Uh, uh, incredible songwriter, of course, Cesar Chavez, and Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, who was one of the earliest feminists in Mexico. Uh, now, of course, there are some individuals that you don't really want to think about the atoms that you have in your body, so you can be selective. So don't listen to every single one of those. Um, and, and the story that I want to tell you a little bit about in more detail, which relates to the work that I do, has to do with the formation of very heavy elements, elements heavier than iron. And there's really three elements uh, that are formed in what I'm going to tell you, these very, very interesting explosions uh, that are really essential to life. Uh, particularly urani uranium and plutonium are actually the elements that are keeping the interior of the Earth uh, hot. So they are actually essential to create a magnetic field in the Earth. So they protect us. Uh, and an element that is, of course, being essential to humanity, which is gold, which doesn't really have a lot of use, but it certainly shaped our civilizations. So I'm going to focus on the formation of gold as our third element in our story. Hydrogen, Big Bang, oxygen in these really massive stars that produce uh, neutron stars, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, and then gold. So you can say, well, but it's gold really important in my body. Well, since you already noticed that you're so atomically numerous, uh, you have about 10 to the 18 atoms of gold in your body. And if you eat sushi, or a lot of uh, uncooked fish, then your iron content, as well as your, your gold content, will be significantly higher. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about gold. Uh, so gold, um, in order to give you a a feeling of how common gold is in the universe and on Earth. I'm going to make this analogy, which I'm giving you a unit, which a unit is one part per billion. And then you say, well, what is one part of billion? Well, one part per billion is equivalent to get a small spoon in an Olympic swimming pool. That's the ratio. So the water that you take with a spoon is about one part in a billion of the total water content of that Olympic swimming pool. Well, that's the content of gold in the universe. So it's incredibly rare, uh, yet uh, incredibly important, as, as they are all of these really, really uh, heavy elements. So in the universe, the content of gold is about 
0.6 parts per billion. In the sun, it's about one uh, part per billion. Now, if you ever heard about the idea of going and mining meteorites or asteroids, that's because their content of heavy elements is significantly higher. It's about a factor of 100 times larger per unit mass. Yeah, so that tells you what is the motivation to go to these places and mine. Now, the vast majority of gold actually in the surface of the Earth has been mined. So what's actually remained, the, the vast reservoir of gold in today's surface is actually in the ocean. But it, it is in small quantities, no? And thankfully, we haven't found a way to actually mine the ocean for gold in a, in a way that I can, cannot pollute the ocean. But we as humans are incredibly rich in gold and in heavy elements compared to the universe and compared to the sun. Yeah, so again, if you're feeling like, you know, your inner shine is not as strong, you should always remember that it is. You know, it's 50 times brighter than the sun. So I go back to my own culture and thinking about, you know, the origin story. And the Aztecs actually believe that the gold was these gold nuggets that you found in the surface of the earth came from the sun and it was sweat from the sun now now we know that of course the you know the sun contains one you know almost one part per billion of gold but the gold was actually not made there and if we think about the you know the history of humanity trying to make gold you know everyone wanted to be an alchemist what i'm going to actually tell you is how the universe actually makes gold and what are the necessary conditions that you need to make these precious elements so i'm going to give you a gold recipe and i'm going to say you need not one, but two of the, of the densest objects in the universe, these two neutron stars, and we'll talk more about that. You have to basically boil them at billions of degrees, and then you can get gold. Yeah? And that was the theory that I worked for for about a decade, thinking about how you actually can make, how oh, the universe can make gold. So we can make gold in our computer uh, because we can simulate the conditions, these extreme conditions. So what is a neutron star? So a neutron star is a remnant that's left when a massive star dies, that massive star that produced the oxygen in your body. And they're like the densest objects in the universe. So a neutron star is the size here of Manhattan Island or the San Francisco Bay, but it has the mass of the sun. That's intense. So if the density of water is one in a particular unit, the density of a neutron star is 14 orders of magnitude higher. Yeah? So a cube of neutron star weights as much as Mount Everest. Yeah? So that gives you a feeling of, oh, these things are incredibly tense. Uh, and you know, about 2% of these neutron stars uh, belong to a binary system. Yeah, a lot of stars, especially massive stars, don't like to live by themselves, and they have a partner for life. And a smaller fraction of those have two neutron stars. And then these two neutron stars are in the form of binaries. And we know in our own Milky Way, because they're actually really hard to find, about a dozen of them, where the two objects are, two neutron stars. Now, these systems evolve in an incredibly impressive way because, as Einstein basically predicted, these, uh, you know, gravity creates these deformations of space and time, and these systems are so incredibly dense that the perturbations of what we call gravitational waves, the waves that they generate, are of such high amplitude that they actually make the system shrink. They basically carry both what we call energy and angular momentum of the system. And these objects go into this beautiful dance for hundreds of millions of years until they basically come so close together that merge. And it is at that instance when they touch each other that the right conditions for the generation of these heavy elements can exist, or so we thought and speculated about it.
What I'm going to show you here is uh, a simulation of two neutron stars in the computer. So you can actually see the clock is in milliseconds. And again, we're showing uh, entropy or temperature. And you know these objects basically touch each other, come together, generate huge amount of heat. Uh, so you have temperatures of billions of degrees uh, and very dense material, which you need. And did you see that they produce what we call these tidal tails? These amount of material, you know, almost like a spiral. And a fraction of that mass actually gets ejected to the interstellar medium. And it is in those tidal tails where gold is actually produced. And when these two objects merge, they're actually going to become a black hole. So while the oxygen in our bodies signal the formation of a neutron star, the gold in your body signal the formation of a black hole when two neutron stars actually came together. Yeah? So it's kind of mesmerizing that it took the densest objects in the universe at the highest temperatures in order to produce gold. No? So doing, you know, being an alchemist in the lab was not going to be a very effective uh, long-term pro job prospect. <clears throat> now, what we did, we said, well, how can we actually tell that these objects actually produce gold? So we made predictions as to these, these very heavy elements are radioactive, and as they're ejected, they actually produce light. And the light we predicted was going to basically become bright and then dim on the order of about a week. And that was the prediction. And then the question becomes, well, how can we find two neutron stars that are about to merge? And that's the next part of the story. Uh, so no, many people believe that this was actually a viable mechanism <laughs> to produce gold. Until August 17, 2017, which I think after the birth of my two children is probably one of my favorite days. Uh, why? Because for the first time in the history of humanity, humans have the ability to measure gravitational waves. Those distortions of space and time, the way actually, so basically mass creating these distortions, those distortions come to Earth, and we now have the equipment necessary to see those distortions. And what I'm showing you here is basically the event of two neutron stars merging. Um, frequency is basically the frequency of the gravitational waves. And high frequency means, you know, as these objects are basically getting closer and closer together, they go around faster. So they're basically emitting gravitational waves at a higher, higher frequency. And that's why you see the two objects are coming together and then almost exponentially merge. Yeah. And for the first time, we say, oh, we detected a gravitational wave. Now we can try to go and find that light that will tell us whether or not this system produced gold. <clears throat> and I'm going to do a little experiment to explain you these um, bananas in the sky <laughs> that you're seeing. <laughs> so gravitation, I mean, the, the, what we call the LIGO interferometer that detects gravitational waves has two detectors across the U.S. And the way the gravitational waves are detected, uh, it's very similar to the way that our ears operate. Yeah? We're basically, as sound waves come into our ears, we're actually, the bones oscillate and we're detecting those oscillations. Now, sound gets damped but gravitational waves don't, no? So ultimately what they're doing is they're moving the detector, they're compressing Earth, and we see those compressions and expansions from the gravitational wave. Now, if you close your eyes and you think about hearing a noise, you know, you cannot actually tell if the noise is coming from the front or is coming from the back. So we're blind to this symmetry axis. And those bananas that you look in the sky is because we had two detectors. So LIGO said, oh, well, it came somewhere around the sky in that direction. But what happened to this event? This event, the localization in the sky, the way that we actually say, oh, this event came from this part of the sky, drastically increased. Why? Because two days before, an instrument in Italy turned on. 
and then we had three detectors. So we broke that symmetry and we were able to pinpoint the position much better. And that was essential because it is incredibly difficult to find you know, a transient in these very extended regions in the sky, but if you have a much more accurate position, you can. And in addition, this event also was followed by an incredibly bright gamma ray emission that we can also detect with similar accuracy. Uh, so that was an incredible coincidence that you know, the universe conspired from an event that took, you know, billions of years to come to Earth to make sure that it came three days after the Italian detector was turned on. Uh, so that's an amazing. <laughs> now, we are a team that wanted to basically discover the light as soon as possible, as well many teams across not only the country, but the, the world. And we're part of a team that is called the One Meter Two Hemisphere. It's not very inventive. Uh, but we have One Meter Telescope, Lake Observatory, just right here. And we had a One Meter Telescope in Chile, the Swope Telescope. Why? Because we didn't know if it was going to come in the north and the south. That was very difficult to predict, so we wanted to cover our bases. We wanted to have two telescopes. And this object actually came from the south. So we didn't use Lake Observatory, but we were part of the team, leading the team that were looking for these gravitational wave signals. And I just wanted to tell you that we were competing with very, very large telescopes. So this is basically um, the telescope, particularly led by Harvard, had a four meter telescope. Uh, we had a one meter telescope. So they had 12 times the field of view so they can cover a much larger piece of that uncertainty in the sky. But they can also go much deeper because you know they can collect more photons. So I like to think about this story as sort of like the David and Goliath story, <laughs> no? in which we sort of use, you know, we outsmart the use of a four meter telescope with a one meter telescope by doing the following, yeah? So <clears throat> this is a, a picture of where um, the object was in the sky and when it was detected. And this is a field of view of our telescope. Uh, something that you will notice is by the time, when the time that this object was discovered, it was actually daytime in Chile. So we had to wait to nightfall. We, you know, we needed to wait until the, you know, the system was behind the sun to actually observe it. So if anyone would have had a one meter telescope in Africa, they would have made the detection first. Now, something that we did is, you know, if you're looking, you know, for a large piece of the sky and you're competing with a much better telescope, you say, well, rather than actually look at the entire surface, we're just actually going to pinpoint at the galaxies we know exist within that volume. Why? Because these systems live in galaxies and they should be associated with galaxies. And that was basically the saving grace. That's what gives us the advantage. Uh, so, 8.14 p.m. in Chile, 46 minutes after sunset, about the same time as you see here uh, at Lick. And that's why I'm speaking right now, so then you can go and look at the telescopes. But it was 10 hours after the event. Uh, and what you're seeing there is the, the sort of small banana in the sky, and what you see in the black points are galaxies within that volume. And we started just pinpointing those galaxies. And we just don't do it, you know, we didn't do it randomly, but we'll build an algorithm to maximize the probability of finding one of those. And I'll show you who was responsible for that. <laughs> so there you go. So these are our pointings as a function of time until we found the galaxy. It was relatively promptly, but we were about three minutes before the other telescopes. <laughs> so, you know, UC Santa Cruz team was the first team to actually see the electromagnetic radiation associated with a gravitational wave signal. So an object not only radiated in gravitational waves, but also in photons, and we detected them. <clears throat> so here is the detection. 
this is the host galaxy that we found in. Uh, we, you know, I, I told you that it was going to fade in about about a week, and that's what we saw. But another prediction that we made is if this object actually made a lot of these heavy elements, it's going to be incredibly red. And you can see that it was very blue at the beginning, but it became incredibly red as predicted. And in fact, by looking at its spectrum and looking at its light curve, we are incredibly confident that what we're seeing is the formation of these heavy elements in real time as they're basically radioactively decaying back to a stability. So, Oh, I know this slide doesn't have their names, uh, but this is the UC Santa Cruz team. Uh, I'm proudly the oldest member of the UC Santa Cruz team, uh, and it was led by my colleague Ryan Foley, uh, who's next to me on the long hair. But as you can see, we have an incredibly diverse and early career team, which we're incredibly proud of. And Dave here, uh, who was actually a software engineer who says, like, I love astronomy, I want to do a PhD in astronomy, <laughs> uh, devised the algorithm for us to actually sort the galaxies in a way that allows to actually be first. Yeah? So, to give you a feeling, um, so we were actually able to calculate how much gold one of these events actually produces. Um, this is uh, ultimately the Nature paper basically confirming that our theories about binary neutron star mergers uh, forming heavy elements was correct. And in this event, we produce, or you know, the universe produced about a Jupiter mass of gold. Now, Jupiter has 10 to the 28 grams. One gram of gold is about $10, so about 10 to the $29. So it was a, uh, we cannot even think about those numbers. But more interestingly, this is equivalent as, you know, to the gold content of about a million stars. Now, you can start thinking about the production, because I told you oxygen is formed when one neutron star is made. But then for these systems, I have to make two neutron stars, they have to remain in a binary, and then they have to spend hundreds of millions of years dancing with each other until they merge. So they're much rare events. So these, these heavy elements actually are made in very, very few events, but they produce a huge amount of mass. Yeah? And in fact, we see this in the early universe because in the early universe, if you think about something that is rare, the analogy that I want you to take home thinking about how the universe is enriched is if you have a process that is very, very common and produces little amount of mass, let's call the heavy elements chocolate, <laughs> you will have a chocolate cookie with a very thin layer of chocolate that is really well dispersed. But if you have a system that produces a lot, a lot of heavy elements and it's rare, you have a chocolate chip cookie, where all of the chocolate is very highly concentrated. So if you're a gas cloud close to the chocolate chip cookie early on, you're going to have a lot of gold. But if you're far away from the chocolate cookie, you're going to have very little. And that's exactly what we see. When we look at low metallicity stars, we see that there's wide variations in their gold content. Why? Because the formation of these elements is actually a rare process in the universe, which is uh, something that it's beautiful, which we used to argue that these neutron star mergers were, in fact, the avenue to make these heavy elements, but no one believed until we had proof. And that's how science should be. So this discovery of the gravitational wave coincident with the electromagnetic signature and the production of heavy elements was deemed the science breakthrough of the year. And our team basically produced half of the papers of this issue. Yeah? And every single one of those papers were led by an early career astronomy, astronomer. Um, so what I want you to think about 
is that the universe is this constant recycling and there's all these amazing, incredible, uh, incredibly extreme events that are ha constantly happening in the universe. They're throwing material into the interstellar medium. The interstellar medium is mixing and the new clouds are formed, new stars, and that recycling continues. So you can ask how many neutron stars mergers have taken to make the gold in your body and the answer is about tens of thousands. You know, while your body has codified sort of hundreds of millions of supernovae, has m much fewer neutron star mergers because they're rare, no? But they produce more mass. And I wanted to sort of use this analogy a little bit to tell you about the gold content on Earth. Um, why? Because the vast majority of the gold when the Earth was formed, uh, and oh, I have my slide in Spanish, so that's beautiful. Uh, <coughs> when the Earth was formed, so that means this is where we are right now, this is just after formation, the Earth was actually molten. It was hot. And all the heavy elements actually sank into the center. So all the gold, the vast majority of the gold on Earth is actually in the core, but you say, oh, Enrico, wait a minute. Like, how is it that we find all this gold? And geologists struggle with this idea for a long period of time until they basically discover oops, that gold was actually carried in the Le Bombardment by asteroid and meteorite impacts onto the surface of the Earth. Remember, we talked about how incredibly metal-rich they are. So by the time the moon was forming, the Earth was basically being covered by blink. <laughs> All of this gold was basically, and that gold was basically being mixed in the just outer layers of the Earth. And that's ultimately how gold came to be. Okay. So you have this story of Neutron star mergers um, requiring, you know, incredibly dense and high temperature conditions, merging, ejecting this material, this material forming a solar system, <laughs> forming the planets, and then the surface of the Earth basically acquiring more gold by these impacts. Yeah? And I wanted to finalize my talk by having a reflection. Um, and similarly to gold coming to the surface of the Earth, I wanted to tell you a little bit about a myth um, that my grandfather, who was Mexican indigenous from the Chichimeca culture, told me, uh, which I think it's a beautiful analogy. And it says, when we are conceived, or soul or essence comes to us, yeah? But in the journey to us, it breaks into millions of pieces. And it says, when you start regaining consciousness, you're going to actually feel incomplete. That's a fairly human uh, sentiment to have. But he said, but that's actually an incredible opportunity for you. Because the vast majority of the pieces, it's not like they fell into the ground and you have to collect them. They actually fell into other people. And it's only by sharing those pieces that you will become more complete. And there are going to be individuals in your life that are going to have these huge pieces that are going to make you very incredibly uh, whole. But in your journey to be complete, every single human interaction is essential because you will never be complete. No? And I find this idea of thinking about who we are cosmologically speaking, atomically speaking, how similar supernovae that form the oxygen atoms in my body form yours. Not only that, that we're constantly recycling oxygen atoms and we're made of the same material. And I find kind of anchoring or thinking about our cosmological origin as a way to think about what makes us human rather than what separates us. And I'll stop there and I'll take questions and thank you for your time and the next time you see a gold ring i hope that you realize the number of extreme conditions that actually was required to make that thank you
We can turn on the lights a little bit, Ellie, if you want. Unless people have no questions. Yes. Question. Yeah, actually, one of my kids was asking me this, and I didn't know the answer. So the periodic table, is that a done deal, or are there still elements out there that are yet to be discovered in the universe? Yeah, so that's a really incredibly important question. We believe that the vast majority of elements that are stable are in the periodic table. And what people now discover are basically elements that are short-lived you know, whose decay time is very, very short. So we can see these very, very heavy elements, but they're not stable. Um, what is actually kind of beautiful is that you can look at the spectrum of the sun, you know, you can basically divide the light of the sun and see every single element of the periodic table <laughs> in the sun, no? So for us astronomers, uh, you know, the sun, really the spectrum of the sun is our periodic table, no? It tells us what the content of the universe is. Uh, so yeah, we believe that, that you know, stable elements, we have a really deep understanding of all of them. Although it's surprising that your dad doesn't know the question of something, but <laughs> you'll learn that that becomes a current, you know, a more common occurrence with time, but... Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's a very interesting question. And, um, I could show you the abundance pattern of the sun just to illustrate. So, the va you know, what we call heavy elements uh, that are very abundant as are all the way to iron, to the iron peak, because that's where stability lies. Um, so iron is like about a few percent of the mass of the sun. And then after iron, they are incredibly rare. The, the, the percentage of those, you know, vastly decreases where the content is very small as we talked about that. So things like carbon, oxygen, iron, all of these elements that are much more abundant uh, are much more common, no? But these rarer elements are not. Um, and yeah, so the way that I think about this is that, you know, you start with hydrogen <laughs> and helium and then you constantly start reprocessing, no? Uh, and ultimately, there's multiple generations. And if you have things like these that are rare and produce not a, a lot of mass, then you end up with not a lot of heavy elements today. But it's a little deceiving because we also call heavy elements things like sulfur, nitrogen. But you should think about, in this case, everything above the periodic table that it's iron. And in fact, there's something interesting that about the, uh, you know, once you get to the iron peak and you can look this at the periodic table, the stability requires them to have many more neutrons. So while all the elements that have equal number of neutrons and protons are very common, and then things that have a significantly fraction of neutrons will start being rarer. And, and this is why this process is called neutron capture, because the vast majority of these elements are actually made by capturing neutrons. But yeah, I think, you know, and, and astronomers make a mess of this all the time because we call a metal anything that is basically not hydrogen and helium. So for us, carbon is that really could be a heavy metal too. <laughs> Does, is that, yeah? Yes. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Uh, so that supernova remnant that I show you here, I'm gonna go back. Actually, let's go to to the my you. We didn't plan this question, but we're gonna we're gonna go back to my first slide. That that's a baby supernova. That's the youngest supernova that we know in our Milky Way. You know how old it is? Almost as old as your dad. It's about 50 years old. And this is the youngest object. So these are the youngest freshly synthesized oxygen that we know in the Milky Way. So this process is occurring constantly in the universe. And the injection of metals will continue. As long as there are massive stars in the universe, these, uh, you know, these systems will continue to produce metals. And in fact, the metal content of the universe is just always increasing. Now, if you want me, I can tell you about like the long-term future of the universe, and that's a, a little sadder story because at some point, there, we're not gonna actually form any more stars. 
and the, then the stars will actually cease to exist and there will be no new stars and there will be no metals producing, but it's going to take a long time. Yeah. But that's a great, uh, great question. So we see these in the, in the Milky Way all the time. So let me give you, in our own Milky Way, a supernova happens once every 100 years, more or less. So almost one per human life. Yes? What about the formation of gold being two neutron stars and then that would then create a black hole mm -hmm. and you have the ejecta? Why are you the trails? Why were the trails not sucked into black holes? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, because they were ejected with enough velocity to escape the gravitational attraction of what was inside because they're not, um, you know, they're, they're ejected a little bit of a larger distance. So they move, you know, similar, for example, if you think about, you know, what we call escape velocity in the, on Earth, no? if you think like how fast I have to move to actually escape the gravitational force of the Earth, the, in a neutron star it's about 30% of the speed of light. So these tails are moving about 30% of the speed of light. They're able to escape the gravitational force, but then of course by the time the black hole comes, those are far away and they're like, you know, your gravity doesn't do much to me, so they <laughs> escape. But you're right that the vast majority of the gold went back in. Went back in. It actually it got broken up before it went inside the black hole, but yeah. Yeah? Oh no. Oh, I, th I thought I saw a hand. Uh, yes? Uh, since uh, it seems like in 2017 it's like sort of a scramble to like get the information I need. Since then, what's like been done to extreme like the process of like how many more events have been discovered? Yeah. So it was, it, was, it was actually, like sociologically speaking, it was an incredibly interesting story because you had to sign into the LIGO um, event. You had to basically sign like a memorandum of understanding of known disclosure that you were not going to say what they were seeing. And we were, you know, they will send us the position in the sky. And then every single team in the world was started looking at. In fact, these, uh, what well, it's called kilonova rather than a supernova um, because it's, a thousand times brighter than a nova, and we give them the, the designation kilonova. This kilonova was observed by the largest number of astronomers ever in the history of astronomy. When you look at, for example, the paper uh, describing all of the observations that took place of the system, you know, the author list is tens of thousands of people. Uh, to your question, uh, have we detected other neutron star mergers? The answer is yes but with not enough accuracy in the sky for us to actually find another one of this. So for the next, you know, four or five years, we'll be searching for the systems, but we haven't seen many. LIGO detects about maybe once of these every two years. And now LIGO is turned off, and it's gonna turn on again, and it's gonna have much higher sensitivity, so it's gonna be able to actually detect a larger number. And now, all the alerts are made public, and they tell you, you know, uh, we detected this object from this part of the sky. It's basically sent into a telegram. Everyone in the world knows at the same time. And then you have to plan your observational, uh, you know, acquiring of data, you know, uh, to do it quickly. So people have dedicated surveys to, to try to find these systems. But if the position uncertainty is not very accurate in the sky, it's really difficult to find these things because there are so many transients that are so much more prevalent and common uh, that it's like trying to find a needle in the haystack. So we haven't detected one yet. So we can say that so far we're the only ones that have, but you know, it's gonna change soon. <laughs> I mean, we have two, but I guess that makes up one. And then one in Italy is running. 
and we got more planned. Yeah, so we have two L shapes. So each detector is an L shape. Each one, each one is an L shape of about you know four kilometers, like a little bit less than three miles. And then what what it does is actually sends a laser back and forth, and they're basically at the exact same distance. So when the laser comes, they basically de you know constructively interfere, and deconstructively just takes out the laser line. And then when a gravitational wave gas by, it actually changes the lengths of the detectors and we can actually see the change in distance at a precision that it's incredible. So we have two detectors, you know, one here in the US, the other one in the US, and then we have a detector um, and uh, we have other detectors but they're not as powerful and really things are going to change when LIGO India is actually made. So there's going to be a third very, very powerful detector in India that will be very similar to that in the US. And once we have three detectors, the position and accuracy in the sky is going to be much better. So now, wait a minute, there's, there's two detectors in the U.S.? Yeah, and then there's one in Japan and one in Italy, but they're not as sensitive. Hmm? Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. So, for example, well, this event was incredibly bright in gravitational waves, but the LIGO, the, the Virgo detector, which is the Italian detector, did not see it. And he should have seen it, but the fact that he didn't see it told us where in the sky it was. So not listening helped. <laughs> equal. There's two. They're you know better, and then Italy is helping, but yeah. we're waiting for India to be equivalent. Yeah. So so if we really want really accurate position in the sky, is it's it's going to be incredible. To give you a maybe just an analogy of how these gravitational waves. You know, we talked about that the gravitational wave detectors are sensitive to the amplitude of the wave which is basically the same way that your ears work. But when we detect photons with our eyes, we're sensitive to the amplitude square of the wave, which is the energy. And you say, oh, that doesn't tell me anything. But for example, what it means is that you can actually hear much farther away than you can see. Because you know, in standard electromagnetism, the power of a wave goes as one over R square, but the power of the amplitude goes as one over R. So that means that if we make the detector on Earth a little bit more sensitive, we can go linearly outwards. And that's actually changed the game drastically because the number of sources, you know, increases as the volume. <laughs> so, so, you know, the new detector it's basically going to probably be a hundred times more sensitive than these detectors. And, you know, they're detecting a lot of black hole black holes, which are more massive and much easier to see, but not as many neutron star neutron star mergers. So, do they need a really accurate clock to be able to determine what direction they're coming from? Yeah, they, they have to get, you know, basically the time difference. No, because the gravitational wave comes here and then comes here. And then we also have position, some position uncertainty because the waves are polarized. So the polarization actually tells us something about where in the sky is coming. So combining all of that, we can actually build position uncertainties in the sky. So I think that that okay, thank you so much for your time.